change. Will there ever be peace on the earth? Now, there's no question that peace is a great desideratum. It's what everyone, what everyone wants. This is a, a picture of the, the Pope praying for peace in Syria. I don't know whether you can read that, but his, uh, his solution to the problem <coughs> is dialogue. He says dialogue is the only path which will lead to peace. So just bear that in mind as we go through what we have to say. Uh, <clears throat> and this was the, uh, a prayer of one of the Pope, Pope John Paul II. This was in 2002. Um, he said he had met with a hundred other religious leaders, Christians and non-Christians in Assisi, and <clears throat> in order to pray uh, for world peace. He asked Catholics to fast and to pray for the success of the meeting. He said in particular Christians and Muslims should meet together to proclaim before the world that religion should never become a reason for conflict, hatred and violence. All things that everybody wants and everybody thinks is a good thing. But where is it? This is, this is the, uh, a prayer of the, uh, of the Pope. I pray that your vision of human dignity, and this is speaking about the vision that men may have, will never fail you in pursuit of peace. May you always acknowledge the incomparable worth of every human life, even from the moment of conception. A hint there of uh, the opposition to uh, artificial conception, isn't it? May you contribute to the building of peace by always appealing to what is most noble in the heart of every person. As a reference to the noble character of man. And may that peace which reflects the very goodness of God himself fill your hearts and homes, thereby encouraging you to be tireless workers in the cause of peace. Well, they're, they're, they're great sounding words, aren't they? And, uh, and no doubt peace is a great thing. If, if only it could be procured. There's a, a, a meeting that took place in 2006, uh, a day of prayer for uh, gratitude and peace. But what is today's world like? Well, there's a, there's a picture from Ukraine, which is relatively recently in the news. Uh, obviously, Russia's heavily involved in Ukraine and assisting the, uh, the so-called rebels. It, it's almost a proxy, though, isn't it, for the Russian power? This is Syria. This, this is the place that's been subject of the so-called Arab Spring, and this is what the Arab Spring looks like. It's terrible, awful dis destruction. I think the expression in that little boy's face is so telling, isn't it? The horror that children have been forced to witness. And in Iraq, this is, this is what the world is like, and yet the, the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, and many others, of course, are praying for peace. But, but what's happened? to these prayers, we might say. It's <clears throat> grief and destruction is the story that the world actually has to tell, isn't it? Well, what relevance does all this have to the Bible? We know that this is true. People want peace. There are conferences to procure peace. The head of the church prays for peace. But there isn't any peace. And what's that got to do with the Bible? It's very interesting, actually. Um, there's a rather surprising statement here and we find this in, uh, in Exodus chapter 15 some of the references by the way I'll just put up on the screen and some of them and there's a little symbol little bible symbol at the bottom those are the ones I'd like you to turn up but there's a, there's a curious statement isn't it the Lord Yahweh that is the, the, the God of Israel is a man of war the Lord is his name that doesn't sound very promising does it in terms of world peace if the God that created everything is described here as a man of war. Look at this reference. It's, this is from one of the prophets, Prophet Jeremiah. And he's talking about the way he would exercise judgment on his people. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, so it's God's servant, and will bring him against this land. He's talking about the land of Israel and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about Israel, not just Israel, nations round about, and will utterly destroy them. And, and this is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, acting as God's servant to do these very destructive things. Here's another reference from one of the Psalms. 
again it's a reference to the way God uses certain powers in order to achieve his purpose actually his punishment usually arise O God O Lord disappoint him cast him down that is the the evil man deliver my soul from the wicked which is thy sword so here the psalmist is describing the wicked as God's sword in his hand in order to carry out judgments on people this, is, this isn't the sort of thing that uh, the Pope often speaks about is it another thing to reflect on here this is from the book, one of the historical books of the Bible, Book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 9. It came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, these are uh, two kings of, a, of a Jehu being a future king of Israel, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? What peace? So here's a prophet of God. Jehu was acting as a prophet at that time. And he's saying, well, what peace? So long as this wickedness exists, the whoredoms, thy mother Jezebel, and her witchcrafts are so many. There is some, these are the words we just read together from that uh, 57th uh, prophecy of Isaiah. We've all got our Bibles open at it, so it's no effort to turn to it. That's the uh, little symbol at the bottom. I create the fruit of lips. It's right towards the end of the chapter. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off. So there's a, there's a positive hint, isn't it? And to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. That's what God says in his word. There is no peace to the wicked. And that description is so vivid, isn't it? The wicked is like the troubled sea. There's, there's a, a troubled sea when it cannot rest. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked, whoever the wicked are. Now, we might think, well, yeah, that's all Old Testament stuff, blood and thunder. But just look at what Jesus had to say about peace. This, uh, perhaps we can turn to this one. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 10. Um, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34. The, the references are on the screen anyway. <clears throat> but uh, think not, says Jesus, that I am come to send peace on earth. Well, isn't that what everyone thought Jesus came for? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But this is what Jesus actually said. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. That's extraordinary, isn't it? That's Jesus, the Son of God, saying this to his disciples. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. That was not. That was not the role of Jesus when he came to the earth 2,000 years ago. So we might ask the question, well, does that mean that God is actually the author of war? Very reasonable question in view of the references we looked at in the scriptures. Well, the scriptures answer a question about war. It's in one of the epistles. We need to see, well, what is the origin of war? Where does war actually come from? This is going to be a reference from James, James's epistle. As we can, before I put it up on the screen, we perhaps turn to it. Um, it's James chapter 4. Right at the beginning of that uh, chapter. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Well, that's the question we just asked. Is God the author of these things? In view of the fact that he's a man of war, he uses the people like Nebuchadnezzar as his sword and so on. From whence come wars and fightings among you? And then he answers the question... Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? That's a rather old-fashioned way of saying they come from the impulses that are derived from your own being, your own flesh and blood, your own members, your own bodies. 
ye lust or desire, and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So, what is the origin of war? Well, it's not God. It's not God, it's us. That's what it says, isn't it? The lust that war in your members. It's something to do with human nature. It's not God's nature. It's human nature. That's what this reference is telling us. So sin needs to be controlled. In fact, if we look, we're still in James. So if we look at the previous chapter and verse 17, this is a, these, are the, these are the principles which will determine whether peace is possible. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, and without partiality, without hypocrisy. So notice the order there, the ordinal description. The wisdom that's above is first pure, then peaceable. The purity must come before the peacefulness. And that's really getting closer to the Bible answer to whether there will ever be peace on earth. It isn't like the, the Pope says, that the answer is in dialogue. That's, that's really a human solution. That's what the politicians say. Politicians always say, oh, you just talk to one another and everything will work out okay. That's not what the scriptures are telling us. The scriptures are telling us that the source of war is human nature and something has to be done about, about that before we can move to peace. There has to be a certain purity, whatever that means, before there can be peace. Well, we have a man who came to the earth, he was the Son of God, Lord Jesus Christ, who did deal with that nature that we've read about here, this human nature, the lust that war in our members. He had the same members, or bodies, as we did do, but he never submitted to the impulses that we all know about, that we all understand. And there, that's described there in this uh, reference from uh, the Hebrews. Uh, then must he, Jesus, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the world, that is the end of the age, just the end of the Jewish age, you're talking about, about AD 30 or so, the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, that's what Jesus did. And the subject of the address isn't, we could very much enlarge on that. How did he do it? How did he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? We won't go into all that detail. It's sufficient for us to recognise that that's what he did. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In short, he did not submit, as we all do, to the impulses of our natures. He was able to subdue and control them. And in so doing, he killed, as it were, of the devil, that is, sin in the flesh. The impulses which <coughs> tend to make us all do things which ultimately do result in war and envy and so on. Jesus did it then. So there is a man that God sent, and it was God's initiative to send the Lord Jesus Christ to do this wonderful work, to put away sin, to, to cancel this that's described in James chapter 4, this lust that we don't have, this desire that we cannot obtain, these, these impulses which lead to war have been subdued in this man Jesus. Now, when Jesus said, as we, and we read that, uh, that reference in Matthew chapter 10, he, he said he hadn't come to bring peace, he'd come to set a man at variance. Now, that's not because God likes conflict, it's because conflict is inevitable. There, there's no getting away from it. That if the word of God is introduced into a man's life, it will come into conflict with these lusts that war in his members. There's, there's, they're not compatible. So there will always be a conflict. There will always be tension between what God has said is right and what our flesh says we want. That's, that's what the tension is. And so there's always this conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Introduced it is by the word of God, which, of course, Jesus was that. He was the word made flesh. God had spoken to Israel in time past through the prophets. Now he is 
spoken to us by his son the word made flesh that's who he was and so those words that Jesus spoke introduced this conflict this enmity between our nature the impulses that are natural to us and the word of his father word of God now let's get what, what about peace well the, the, man can't achieve peace even though they recognize it as the most desirable thing possible because they forget this principle they're trying to do a shortcut you can't do a shortcut to peace you have to follow the route that God has laid down you have to deal with sin first before you can get to peace it's like that wisdom which is above is first pure then peaceable you've got to get it in right order the Apostle Paul same nature as us same nature as Jesus the Apostle Paul didn't succeed uh, to the extent that Jesus did though he was a very righteous man and so he was driven to say this I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me to, to the wish to do the right thing because he, he had the word of God but how to perform that which is good I find not amazing that a, that a, a righteous man can say that it's really hard to do what you know is right the good as I would, I do not. And the evil which I would not, that I do. And that's the dilemma that we all find ourselves in, isn't it? And even the Apostle Paul did. Jesus managed, by a remarkable feat of self-control, linked to, linked to his paternity, linked to the fact that he was indeed the Son of God, he managed to do the good that he, that he would and avoid the evil which he would not. He managed to do that. Apostle Paul goes on, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, so he's understood, he's understood what God wants, but it's really difficult to do it. But I see another law, he says, in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me to captivity, to the law of sin, which is in my members. So that's the situation we're all in. But Jesus, we read in that previous reference from Hebrews, has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So that there's a chink of light there, isn't there? There's, there's been some work done by the Son of God to undo the causes of war, the, the sin which rages in our members. That was from Romans chapter 7. And not only is, do we find sin uh, in individuals like you and me, we find it in institutions as well. Sin is installed, as it were, in the institutions that we are surrounded by. And the Apostle Paul describes this. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's there in the institutions of man, as well as in his individual uh, bodies. So what's the solution? Well... The only solution is the return of that man who has managed to subdue sin in himself. And the scriptures promise us that Jesus will in fact return. He'll return and he will depose those powers in which sin is installed and replace them with his father's kingdom. Reference to this is in Revelation chapter 11. The seventh angel sounded, this is, a, this is a symbolic angel, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So there's to be a change, a political change. It won't be achieved by the prayers of men, however sincere, we don't doubt the sincerity of men who pray for peace. They're praying for something which everybody wants, but they're trying to take a shortcut you can't do that you have to follow God's route there is a route to peace but it's it's God's route and Jesus has to return the man who was able to subdue the causes of war in himself sin in the flesh the man who was able to do that must return to the earth and then the kingdoms of this world in which sin is installed as, as a sort of law of operation it will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever now what will be the result of this what will be the result of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because this kingdom which will be established in the earth will not be based on the principles that 
today's kingdoms, republics and democracies and dictatorships are, in today's world, different principles altogether. Because th those institutions, those uh, governments, are all determined by the strength of men, aren't they? Dictators keep their power because they're strong and they, they get rid of any opposition. Um, leaders of democracies are put in power by, by the votes of the people. And who is to say that the votes of the people will always give a wise ruler? Is there wisdom in a great number, a great multitude of people? Remember, the, uh, we used to read uh, Rudyard Kipling's book, The Jungle Book, and there was, there was a people there called the Monkey People. And the monkey people used to say, it must be right because we all say so. It must be right because we all say so. And that's, that's, that's democracy, isn't it? Because it, lots of people say something is right, it is right. But is that true? That's not the way God plans to bring peace to the earth. God plans to bring peace to the earth by sending his son, who has overcome sin in the flesh, to set up his kingdom. And we read this, and it's worth turning this, because we've got a few references now from Isaiah, so we may as well have a look at them. This is Isaiah chapter 32. And uh, <clears throat> looking at verse 16. This is, these are wonderful words, really. This is speaking prophetically of the state of affairs in the earth when Jesus will have returned, when that man who has subdued sin will return. Judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, righteousness remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. There's that order again. Wisdom above first pure, then peaceable. It's the work of righteousness that is peace. You can't take a shortcut to peace. You have to go through righteousness, and that's what Jesus will do when he returns. The effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. The absolute opposite of the state of affairs in the world at the moment, where there's no quietness or assurance. And my people, we read, shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. That is the purpose of God. It is the purpose of God to produce peace on the earth. There is a man of war. That war will one day be abolished as we shall see here's a, another reference from Isaiah and this is a wonderful reference from chapter 9, it's a, it's a prophecy of the son of God um, who is to be born to a woman of the house of David, house of Israel unto us a son, verse 6 unto us a son is born unto us a son is given and the government, a child is born, sorry, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. There it is. First righteous, then peace. First pure, then peaceable. Of the increase of his government and peace... There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. No amount of, uh, of peace conferences and prayers of men and women who don't understand the principles which God has laid down in the scriptures will produce this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will though and Jesus, his son, will return to the earth as is testified over 200 times in the New Testament and will achieve this wonderful aim, the Prince of Peace. And his government and peace will be universal. The kingdom is Israel, of course. The kingdom of God is, the, uh, is established in the land of Israel, but the dominions of that kingdom will extend throughout the whole earth and the whole earth will then experience this peace which it is the purpose of God to establish in the earth. Let's have a look at a few more few more references. Another wonderful reference here in uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and this is this describes the characteristics of the future ruler of the world and, and, it, and we can contrast it so much with the characteristics of present rulers of the world. This is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. Jesus 
was a descendant of David. And a branch shall go out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Now, this, I like this is bit I'd rather like this next bit. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Now, what's the only way that men can judge the truth these days? Well, it's from what they see and what they hear. And that's, that's what our law courts do. They hear things and they see things, and they make their judgments on that basis, don't they? But there's so much that we can't see and there's so much we can't hear that is relevant to the justice of any case. But when Jesus returns to the earth, to rule in peace, in the kingdom of God, in Israel, with his worldwide dominion. He won't judge like that. He won't judge just by what he sees, what he hears. What will he judge with? Well, verse 4, with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. It's because, in verse 2, he is described as having the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It's because the power of God is with him. Because he knows things that men can't see and men can't hear. He knows those things. And so there will not be any miscarriages of justice, as there is in today's judgments. He judge with righteousness and prove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So there will be justice. There won't be any miscarriages of justice. Here's another one going back further into Isaiah chapter 2, before we finish very soon. Isaiah chapter 2, and um, this, this is describing now the, the reaction of the peoples of the world to this new ruler in <coughs> Jerusalem. Instead of resisting it, they'll want to go along with it, they'll want to cooperate, they'll see the benefits of this man on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. Just think of the difference that represents. Here's people wanting to learn about the God who created everything. How different that is from the way, the attitude that men and women have these days. Very few want to learn about the God of Israel. And they, these will flock to Jerusalem to learn about the God of Israel. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the Lord. Zion, another name for Jerusalem, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people. Then they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So there will be peace on the earth. There is a time when the earth will be at peace. It's when Jesus will return and when righteousness prevails as the system of government, not might or democracy or any of the systems that are used by men. Neither shall they even learn war anymore because law, war will no longer be needed. War is needed for a short time. As Jesus said, come to set a man at variance and God did, does use war in order to bring about his purpose on the earth so it's no use praying for peace when it's God's purpose that there should be war that's like uh, G you said what peace so long as the whoredoms thy mother Jezebel prevail in Israel so it, it's, it's a sincere mistake to pray for peace we don't know what God wants to do with the hostilities between nations. We don't know what he is achieving. All we know is that we need to wait for the Prince of Peace to come before we're going to get peace on the earth. So man's efforts to procure peace, it will, they'll continue to fail. They've neglected the righteousness of God. It's only when the Prince of Peace comes that this will happen. Thank you very much for listening.